So we finally come to the last lecture of the molecular diagnostics course, and this lecture is Laboratory Operations and Quality Control. The objectives of the lecture are to describe proper specimen accession for molecular testing, describe the optimal conditions for holding and storage of specimens of nucleic acid, to explain the basic components of molecular test performance including quality assurance and controls, to discuss instrument maintenance, repair, and calibration, to describe recommendations for preparation and use of reagents in the molecular laboratory, and explain documentation and reporting of results. The first thing that's done in the clinical laboratory setting is to assess each specimen. Now pre-analytical error is the consequence of erroneous or misleading results caused by events that occur prior to sample analysis. So in other words, before that sample even got to the laboratory, there was a, a mistake or an error that occurred. So possibly the wrong label was put onto the tube. When it gets to the laboratory, the condition of the specimen and possibly the chain of custody in a forensics laboratory must be reviewed right when the specimen gets there. No specimen should be accepted without the proper label or the proper identification. And if a specimen is unacceptable, if the specimen is disposed of or saved, the specimen has to be recorded in exactly what happened to the specimen, where it is, and why it was either disposed or saved but not analyzed. So in the clinical setting, all specimens must be handled as if they are infectious. So, standard precautions using proper personal protective equipment always must be used. So, gloves are highly recommended, but not only are they part of the standard precautions or the personal protective equipment that everyone in a laboratory commonly uses, but gloves are very critical in a molecular laboratory because gloves will help to protect nucleic acids from nuclease degradation. So DNA can be um, degraded by DNases and RNA by RNases. Now RNA is much less stable than DNA is and RNA is very susceptible to degradation by RNases that are all over the environment. So when handling RNA, gloves are essential. There are transmission-based precautions such as wearing a, an N95 respirator and those would be used if there were airborne transmission transmissible agents and contact pre precautions like your gowns, disposable gowns and gloves must be used for direct patient care and any type of contact transmissible agent. In the molecular laboratory, specimens are commonly um, analyzed that have very little cellular content. So whatever cells might be there, remember your nucleic acids are extracted from nucleated cells. There may not be that many nucleated cells present. When you do analyze um, specimens for molecular testing, you always have to be careful to avoid cross-contamination. You never want to possibly contaminate your specimen with nucleic acid that's in the environment on a pipette tip. So you really have to be careful of cross-contamination. You always want to change your pipette tips whenever you finish um, pulling up a sample. Barrier pipette tips are commonly used in the molecular laboratory so you don't get any molecules of nucleic acid in the tip bottom of your pipette men that you're using. Specimens are always inspected for hemolysis and if white blood cells have lysed then DNA and RNA yield can be greatly reduced, which can lead to false negative reactions. 
Solid tissues are best analyzed from fresh or from snap frozen tissues. And you also can do nucleic acid based tests from fixed tissue, but the quality of the results depends on how those tissue was fixed and the process of the fixation. Some anticoagulants, such as heparin, have been shown to inhibit certain molecular analyses. For example, heparin can inhibit polymerases, which are used in amplification reactions. So certain anticoagulants um, may or may not be the best to use in the molecular setting. So for molecular analyses, tri potassium EDTA and acid citrate dextrose would be the better specimens to use. Heparin may be used but may not be the best specimen for amplification studies. So whenever we get a tube in the laboratory, you have to look at the color of the top of the tube so that you know what type of anticoagulant is used and if this specimen may have an inhibitor in it. So if the color of the top of the tube is red, then that means there's no anticoagulant. If it's green, it means it's sodium heparin. If it's brown, it's a non-freeze-dried sodium heparin. If it's lavender, it has tripotassium EDTA. And if it's yellow, it has acid citrate dextrose. Storage of nucleic acids is critical in the molecular laboratory. So if you have a blood, bone marrow, or fluid specimen, if you hold it at room temperature, it's only good for barely one day. So if you're going to analyze a specimen immediately when you receive the specimen, room temperature would be fine. But if you possibly wanted to analyze that specimen later, then you would not want to keep it at room temperature. So a blood, bone marrow, fluid specimen would be good for three days if you put it in the refrigerator at four degrees. If it's a white blood cell specimen, it would be good for at least one year if it's stored in the freezer at minus 20 degrees or in the ultra low or deep freeze at minus 70 to minus 80 degrees. If it's a tissue specimen, it should never sit at room temperature. It would be fine for about one day in the refrigerator for about two weeks in the freezer at minus 20 and for two years in the ultra freeze at minus 70 to minus 80. If it's isolated or extracted DNA, it would be okay for approximately 26 weeks if it's stored between 2 degrees and 25 degrees, so between the refrigerator and room temperature. If it's stored in the refrigerator, it would be fine for between one to three years for certain types of molecular-based analyses. So for example, you could test it from the refrigerator one year later and do a southern blot on it, but maybe not after one year. It would Isolated DNA is fine for up to seven years if it's stored at minus 20 or actually preferentially at minus 70 to minus 80 degrees. I store all of my isolated DNA for short periods of time in the regular minus 20 degree freezer, but if it's a very critical specimen, I always store in the minus 80 degree free freezer. Now keep in mind that whether you use a regular minus 20 degree freezer or an ultra or deep freeze at minus 70 to minus 80 degrees, you never want to store your nucleic acids or your specimens for molecular based testing in a frost, a defrosting type of freezer. You always want to use a 
the, a freezer that will frost. The reason is the defrosting types of freezers have a, their temperature fluctuates. So they're constantly defrosting and heating up that freezer so that no frost develops. You don't want your nucleic acids to fluctuate in their temperature constantly. That could possibly degrade them. So you always want to use a frosting type of freezer to store your nucleic acids. Now we already said the RNA is less stable. So it's not going to uh, be um, stored for as long as DNA is. So for blood, bone marrow, and fluid, if you keep your RNA or you want to analyze RNA from these specimens and it's in the refrigerator at 4 degrees or room temperature at 23 degrees, it would only be good for less than 2 hours. If you store it at 4 degrees in a denaturant, it would be good for 7 days or at room temperature it might be good for 5 days. If you store it at minus 70 degrees in a denaturant, blood, bone marrow, and fluids, if you were to analyze RNA, you'd want to do that within one to two weeks. If you have white blood cells that you're going to be doing RNA analyses with, you could look at RNA for approximately six months if you store the right white blood cells at minus 70 or two to four weeks at, in a regular freezer at minus 20. If it's a tissue specimen, it's only good for barely two hours from the refrigerator. However, if it's snap frozen and stored at minus 70 degrees, it would be good for up to two years. Tissue specimens can be stored in the vapor phase of liquid nitrogen, which is minus 140 to 150 degrees. It could be fine for up to two years. If you have isolated RNA, so RNA you've extracted from a specimen, you really don't want to store it at room temperature or even in the refrigerator. It may not be very, it may not be stable for very long. It's going to get degraded. It could stay um, fine for up to a month at minus 20 degrees if you store it in DEPC treated water. It could stay for up to a month in DEPC treated water for um, in the minus 70 or minus 80 degrees deep freezer. And if you store it in ethanol in the minus 70 to minus 80 degree freezer, it could be fine for six months. So to, in preparation for RNA analysis, now we already said again that RNA is less stable. So you have to, tr to analyze RNA in the molecular laboratory a little bit differently than how you would analyze DNA. For example, there are many labs that have completely separate rooms where RNA is analyzed and only RNA is analyzed in that room. The room would have designated pipette men, designated pipette tips, a designated hood, and nothing but RNA would be analyzed in that room or that area of the laboratory. So if you had your RNA bench, you'd want to have a, an area that was your RNA area, and you want to keep that area free from RNases. So how you do that is wipe the bench down with these um, sprays that you could purchase that are called RNAs away, RNAs erase, RNAs zap. There's several different types of sprays. You spray the entire bench down. You would spray the equipment that you use down. So for example, you'd spray it on a cloth and wipe down your pipette min. All of the dis disposables that you would use, the micro centrifuge tubes, PCR tubes, have to be certified as RNAs free. And you could also rinse them in DEPC, which is 0.1% diethyl pyrocarbonate. 
any reagent you use, even if it's water, has to be certified as RNase free. And again, you could add DEPC to your reagents so that you don't get any degradation of your RNA. You could also treat your reagents with um, chemicals called RNase Alert, things like that, so you know first of all you're going to inhibit that RNase from degrading your RNA and you could possibly know if there's RNase is present. You can also add RNasins, um, you, so there's all sorts of um, molecular based reagents you could purchase these days for RNA analyses which which do help. So the performance of the testing. The Food and Drug Administration or the FDA requires validation of the performance of clinical test methods and reagents in accurately detecting or measuring analytes prior to use in human testing. So any molecular based test that's performed in a clinical laboratory many years of testing and validation um, analyses have to be done before it can be used for diagnostic tests of humans. How are tests validated or assessed? Well, there are three typical performance assessments and these are the sensitivity, specificity, and the accuracy. So the sensitivity of an assay is the number of true positives over the number of true positives plus false negatives times 100. The specificity of an assay is the number of true negatives over the number of true negatives plus false positives times 100. And the accuracy of an assay is the true negatives plus true positives over the true negatives plus the true positives plus the false negatives plus the false positives times 100. So all of these are values as percents. So validation has to be performed and test validation is performed on specimens of types that will be encountered routinely in the clinical setting. The number of specimen tested is going to vary depending on the procedure as well as the availability of the test material and reagents and results from any new test methodology have to be compared to the results from the currently established procedures in order to correlate them. So is the new test just as good as the previous or the established test? Is it better than the established test? So in other words, in the previously or the current established procedure, the number of positive specimens that we get, are we getting positives from those same specimens in the new test methodology? So validation and how accurate, sensitive, and specific any new test is has to be compared to the previous or currently established protocols. When validating commercially developed and FDA approved methodologies have to be verified using purchase reagent sets to validate any specimen in the laboratory. So you'd want to use specific reagents that are purchased for validation purposes. If any commercial test is modified, validation has to be done to show that it's equal to or superior than the previous protocol or currently used protocol. Once a procedure has been established, that method is documented in the lab according to the guidelines maintained by the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute or CLSI. 
any tests or personnel have to be um, con constantly monitored and this is done using proficiency testing. So in proficiency testing specimens are are sent to a laboratory from a reference source and that laboratory has to test the specimen and then the laboratory is examined to make sure they're getting the appropriate results on that specimen. So organizations such as the College of American Pathologists or CAP are one of the organizations that will supply proficiency tests to laboratories for any type of diagnostic analyses including molecular analysis. If a proficiency specimen is not a commercial, commercially available um, specimen, laboratories may exchange specimens, either split specimens or blinded specimens between the laboratory and it's always good to do inter-laboratory testing. Of course with any type of tests in the clinical setting we have to use controls. So controls are the samples of a known type or known amount that are treated just like the patient specimen and also run along with the patient specimen. So with a qualitative type of test, you would need a positive control, a negative control, and possibly a sensitivity control. With a quantitative test, so something that's going to measure amounts, you need a high positive control, a low positive control, as well as a negative control. And for your amplification methods, you need your amplification controls. So the amplification control you need to avoid any false negatives. So you want your negative control, you want your blank control, that with these we had talked about in our amplification lecture. And you want an amplification control. So you want a specimen that you know will amplify with the reagents that you are using. So if your amplification control shows a product but your patient specimens do not, then you know that the reaction is working so it avoids any false negatives. For a quantitative PCR method that automatically analyzes results, you need a standard curve or a dilution series of the positive control. And with any type of quantitative PCR done in a clinical laboratory, these are all kit-based and they have the standards included in the kit. For methods that require detection of a target specific product or a relative amount of target, you need internal controls that are run at the same time and in the same reaction mix as the test specimen. And these internal controls commonly are housekeeping genes. So housekeeping genes are your constitutively expressed genes and you could use those as a control to know that your reaction is working. So quality assurance is done and this can be done with periodic review and documentation of test results. So test results have to be documented. The molecular quantitative methods should have a defined dynamic range, sensitivity level, and accuracy. And assay levels that distinguish positives from negatives, so in other words, have cutoff values. These cutoff values have to be well defined and verified regularly. So what we're calling a positive and what we're calling a negative six months down the road has to be accurate. So you always have to be reassessing those cutoff values. Not only do um, tests need to be verified, but 
instruments also have to be properly maintained. So manufacturers of instruments will provide recommendations for routine maintenance. So things on the instrument that need to be done daily, weekly, monthly, annually. So the laboratory has to have a schedule for all of these maintenance um, instrument maintenance protocols as well as instructions and techni technologists have to know the limits of the user recommended repairs and when a service call should be done so sometimes technologists can do the repair themselves like changing a bulb in an instrument but sometimes the problem may be beyond something um, a little bit more simple and you'd want to put in a service call because you want to make, make sure that instrument is running properly. In order to make sure the instrument is running properly you want to regularly calibrate or fit that instrument. So a lot of times calibration um, sets or reagents or filters are come with a piece of instrument so that you can regularly calibrate that instrument. An instrument may need to be calibrated on an annual basis. It may need to be calibrated with every new lot of reagents. So it really depends on the instrument and the laboratory protocols. Reagents also have to be validated, so you must make sure that you follow the instructions to prepare the reagents properly. There should be a written lab protocol in each lab on how to prepare the reagents used in the lab. If it's reagents such as primers or probes, the sequences of those primers and probes must be documented in the written lab protocols. And primer binding sets and sizes should also be documented. Analyte specific reagents or ASRs are either probes, primers, antibodies, or any other type of test component that detects a specific target. So most ASRs that are used in the molecular lab are categorized as class 1 ASRs. And class 1 ASRs are not subject to special controls by the FDA. Class 2 and class 3 ASRs are those used by blood banks to screen for infectious diseases or those that are used to diagnose certain contagious diseases such as tuberculosis. In any laboratory there is the potential to use hazardous chemicals. So the National Fire Protection Association has developed warning labels that have to be on any type of chemical container. So these are universal um, symbols that have to be on any reagent or chemical that you purchase. So there's flammability, instability, health hazard labels. So if you were to purchase a chemical and it had a red diamond on it with the number four, that would mean that that chemical is severely flammable, highly flammable. So the number zero through four, zero meaning no hazard, and four meaning a severe hazard. There's also special hazards such as O, which means that that chemical is a strong oxidizer, or W, meaning that that chemical negatively reacts with water. So if you had a W uh, on the chemical label, you would not want to use a, let's say the, a fire developed, you would not want to use a, a fire extinguisher that was water-based to put that fire out because it could react with that chemical and cause an explosion or a worse reaction with the fire. Transport and storage of any type of hazardous chemicals. So reinforced containers are required for transport and handling of any type of dangerous chemicals. And 
we, we use dangerous chemicals in the lab all the time. Any type of acid or phenol would be considered a dangerous chemical. And these chemicals have to be stored in flammable cabinets. So these cabinets have to have proper ventilation and they should be explos explosion proof. Any labs that use radioactive material have to have the appropriate um, symbols and labels on any instrument, on the lab door, on the refrigerator, any place where there might be radioactive material. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC, requires that laboratories working with radioactive reagents maintain a radiation safety manual. And in this manual, it provides all the procedures for the safe handling of radioactive substances. And radioactive reagents are used only in designated areas of the lab, usually behind a lead glass, leaded glass, so that you're not exposed to any radioactivity in case you were to spill it. There's special re, um, cleaning supplies you need to use. There's special spill-proof absorbent pads that have to be on the surfaces. So there's a lot of safety requirements for radioactive um, use in the laboratory. Any lab that has uh, uses radioactivity, they have to have be provided with radioactive safety training on usually an annual basis. Also, anyone working in a radioactive lab has to wear these little pins or badges that are collected on sometimes a monthly basis. It depends on the lab and the amount of radioactive material used, and they have to be monitored. You have to use a Geyer counter on the surfaces, in the refrigerator, anywhere radioactive material may be to make sure that you've properly used and cleaned these areas. Test results must be properly documented. So any test results, whether it's an electropharogram, a gel image, an auto rad, have to be high enough quality that there's nothing ambiguous there. You have to document all of the assay conditions, the reagent lot numbers, the quality, and the quantity of the isolated nucleic acid. In situ, in situ results, such as FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization, are correlated with histological findings, such as your stained sections of tissue morphology. And raw data is retained with that final report and clinical interpretation of the test results. Any test that's reported has to show the method that was used or the manufactured kit that was used, as well as the locus, the mutation, or the organism tested, the analytical interpretation of the raw data, and the clinical interpretation of the analytical result. It should also include the likelihood of any false positive or false negative results. And reporting can have disclaimers. So when a class one ASR is used in an analytical method, there may be a, a disclaimer that's included in the test report. A disclaimer such as this one, the FDA has determined that such clearance or approval is not necessary. This test is used for clinical purposes. It should not be regarded as investigational or for research. This laboratory is certified under the Clinical Laboratory Approv Improvement Amendments of 19. 88 as qualified to perform high complexity clinical laboratory testing. And there's similar types of disclaimers that may be added to test reports. So in summary of this lecture, proper specimen handling is required for accurate test results. Specimens must be held, maintained, and stored under conditions that will properly preserve the nucleic acids. 
molecular test performance has to be monitored through the use of quality controls. Instruments have to be maintained and calibrated for accurate detection and measurement of the analytes. Reagents have to be prepared, stored, and used as recommended by the manufacturer as well as the laboratory protocol and raw data should be documented and results must be clearly reported.